Chers amis, bonjour. I'd like to talk to you about one of my daughters, Severn. When she was 12 years old in 1992, she had quite an impact in Rio when we were at the Earth Summit. And I remember watching her as she was being interviewed by one of the reporters. The reporter said, well, we grown-ups have done a bad job taking care of the environment, but you kids, you're different. You're going to make the difference and save the world. I was amazed at her response. This 12-year-old kid replied, Oh, is that your excuse for not doing anything? You're going to wait for us kids to take over and change the world? Is that your excuse for not changing your ways? And then she added the kicker. How can we be any different when you're our role models? We grow up watching you and we copy you. Don't tell me you're going to have to wait for us to grow up and change the world when you're setting the example. And that was such a powerful thing. What we're talking about now is the kind of future we're going to leave for our children. We can't just say, oh, well, our children will be more conscientious. They're going to recycle. We've got to be a part of that agent of change. Whether we like it or not, our generation, all of us now living on this planet, share a unique responsibility in the history of humanity. We are the first generation that can radically change the wealth and quality of life of those who will come after us. We know our climate is changing as a result of unrestrained energy consumption. We know our natural resources, water, forests, oceans everywhere, are being depleted fast. The air we breathe, the water we drink, our food, everything is in the balance as a result of our insatiable appetite for almost everything. We're beyond fulfilling our basic needs. Now we're serving our wants, and there's no limit to how much we want. As a result, we've far exceeded this planet's capacity to provide us with the resources we need to sustain our lives in the future. We're living on credit. We're tapping into future generations' wealth and quality of life to fulfill our own immediate wants. Every day, we're leaving a deeper debt for future generations. Except that this ecological debt is special. It can't be paid back. Once resources are gone, once our climate is out of control, once water resources are depleted, they won't come back. We're burning pieces of our house to heat ourselves, but soon there'll be no house left for others to live in. This is why this generation is special in the history of humankind. I am certain that we will be judged by future generations on the basis of what we have done to restore our balance with nature or on our failure to do so. People say to me over and over, you know, Suzuki, the bottom line is the economy. If we don't have a strong economy, we can't afford to protect the environment and do all of those other things that you want. The Canadian economy has more than doubled in size in the last 20 years, and still we can't afford to protect our environment? How can we create wealth when we are depleting the natural capital that provides us with everything we base our economy on? Maybe there's something fundamentally wrong about how our economy functions. Recently, Thomas Friedman wrote in the New York Times, what if the crisis of 2008 represents something much more fundamental than a deep recession? What if it's telling us that the whole growth model we created over the last 50 years is simply unsustainable economically and ecologically? And that 2008 was when we hit the wall, when Mother Nature and the market both said, no more. Can we meet our generation's challenge with the same speculative, irresponsible, debt-driven and wasteful vision that led us to this crisis? I don't think so. We need a revolution. Now is the time to reinvent ourselves, our relationship with our planet. Now is the time to think about real wealth and quality of life for our children. A few years ago, I wrote a book called The Sacred Balance that takes a very different look at things, beginning with the obvious fact that we are biological creatures. We are animals. And our biological nature dictates that air, water, soil, energy from the sun, those are the real bottom line. 
Do we think somehow that we've escaped our biological roots? What is the most important thing that we need every minute of every day of our lives? It's the air. If you don't have air for two minutes, you're dead. If you don't have clean air, you're sick. And yet we use air as a toxic dump and think somehow it's going to go away. People jump in their Hummer or big SUV, maybe to go five blocks, maybe to drive instead of walk, and that vehicle is pumping all of its chemicals into the air. When you see a couple with their child in a stroller, where do you think that child's nose is? Right at the height of the exhaust pipes of all of those cars. So in the sacred balance, I try to show what our real fundamental needs are. We are also social beings. And as social beings, we need love. Love is the important element that teaches us how to love others, how to empathize, how to be a part of the human community. We're spiritual beings. And surely, if we're looking at how we go into the future in a sustainable way, it's to protect the most fundamental things that we need. And then we ask the question, what kind of an economy can we have as we protect those fundamental social, biological, and spiritual needs? In a finite world, we can't grow forever. I think we really have to examine the whole assumption of this economic system. In a time of economic turmoil, as we're facing now, we have a unique opportunity to say, hmm, what did we do wrong? And what can we do now to turn the situation around in order to create a new model that will make more sense? So how do we go about reinventing ourselves? We all feel so isolated, powerless. We often feel that it's already too late. But we have the power to imagine a new world and to convince others that a better world is possible. Let me try. Imagine a world where all children could swim in the nearest waterway. Imagine communities where you could walk to school and to work, have lunch at home with your kids, and be at home on time to spend quality time together. Imagine cities without cars, without traffic jams, and with streets transformed into gardens and parks. Imagine declining cancer rates, declining respiratory illnesses for children and the elderly, because we've stopped poisoning ourselves and our environment. Imagine every house is energy self-sufficient, so that we don't need to build huge power facilities anymore. Imagine that we're replenishing our renewable resources and producing zero waste. This is not science fiction or an idealistic fantasy. This is what is currently happening in communities around the world right now. Why would it be impossible for us? Our challenge is to recover the capacity to imagine another world and then stand up and do it. One woman may be an inspiration for us. In 1955, one woman, Rosa Parks, decided she would no longer accept segregation and she refused to sit in the back of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. By doing so, she freed the minds and souls of thousands who decided they would no longer use public transit unless segregation was abolished. Within weeks, the civil rights movement was born. Within months, the city transit company went bankrupt. Less than 50 years later, we have an African-American president in the United States. What a revolution in just over two generations. This is our challenge. We have to open our eyes now and start to act. We have one generation starting today to complete our revolution, restore our balance with nature. Quebecers have done it before. You had your quiet revolution. It all started the day you collectively decided to stand up. Let's start a global one. I'm calling on you to join us now as we start reinventing our world together. Each of us should begin imagining tomorrow's world and share these ideas with each other. If we do this, we'll go a long way towards creating the vision we need to begin changing things. I'd like to tell you one last story before ending. My daughter Severn, who made that statement in Rio when she was 12, will soon have her first child. It's her turn now to become a role model for a new human generation. As I look back at the things my father taught me about nature 
how we need to be respectful of our environment. I feel that there is great wisdom coming from past generations. As I look ahead and think of my children and grandchildren, I have great hope in their vision, in their capacity to take on this challenge of restoring our balance with nature. It gives me great comfort and hope that our relationship with this planet transcends generations, nations, and cultures. Because above all, we're all human beings, traveling in space and time as a single species, all of us together. A bientôt.